Hi everyone, Brian here, wishing you a great Monday and a wonderful week ahead. Uh, we are continuing to look a little bit at the initial experience of Samuel, uh, for whom two books of the Hebrew uh, Bible is named, First and Second Samuel, uh, which marks much of the uh, exciting and interesting life he led. Uh, but we're just really looking at the very beginning of his uh, life's experience when he was still a young person, uh, probably only a young teenager, uh, and uh, had his first experience of what we're calling the deep voice within, uh, the voice of the soul, uh, the deep self uh, that can speak to our very busy everyday self if we uh, attend to it, nurture it, and understand in the beginning that it's there. And that's been the theme for our uh, whole series, uh, looking at uh, the various figures of the Bible, and instead of simply looking for their historic place or their theological significance, though that's both there and very important, uh, we're continuing to look for the soulfulness that has been written into the scriptures for us and has existed in Christian tradition all along. Today I'd just like to look at uh, one small little uh, event that happened right at this beginning story that we heard on Friday uh, and uh, have it remind us of the great arc of the experience of the divine within that we learned in the long story of uh, Abraham as he experienced um, this deep uh, uh, connection to God, uh, but then even more so in the arc that continues from Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. I don't think it's a mistake and I don't think it's just a historical curiosity that we all in the West, especially Christians and Jews, uh, think of ourselves as faithfully uh, following Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not just the patriarchs in terms of history or uh, the patriarchs in terms of uh, how God acted in their lives, uh, but they are the foundation of the story of how the divine uh, truth, the rhythm of the divine, the Holy Spirit, many, many names for it, uh, has an arc of experience, not only in their lives, but in all our lives. Uh, we pointed out that the first thing that God does uh, when uh, speaking to us uh, from the deep self is to offer comfort and hope and joy. Uh, this is because actually hearing, um, uh, sometimes in actual words, but most often in impressions, uh, coming to understand that one is standing in a numinous place, a, <coughs> excuse me, a joyous place, a hope-filled place, uh, something that takes us out of the ordinary into the extraordinary. Coming to comprehend this uh, is, um, well, as we say today in so many circumstances, awesome. Uh, and uh, because it's awesome, uh, the, this voice, this rhythm of the soul always begins by being very gentle with us. Uh, so if we go back to Friday, for example, we'll remember that uh, in the little section we heard at the beginning of the first, no, no, the third chapter of Samuel, when Samuel's being called, um, there is this Samuel, Samuel. Uh, I don't think it's a great booming voice, um, nor did Samuel. I mean, if you thought it was something, you know, so overwhelming, uh, he would have known that it wasn't Eli. But it was such a gentle, quiet voice uh, that he thought it might be the voice of Eli coming to him from another room. So, uh, once again, we have evidence that when God speaks to us, it, it, the first thing that God wants is to be gentle, to nurture us wherever we are in our life's journey. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
And, and we see this, by the way, all through the scriptures when uh, quite often whenever an angel comes, what are the first words that they say? Be not afraid. Uh, and I think that the angel that uh, scripture talks about becomes a trope um, for uh, these individuals who've experienced the deep voice within uh, and uh, don't know how to explain it. It is difficult to explain. And uh, so they said, I heard an angel. And, and uh, over the centuries, of course, we've let our fantasy run riot with what an angel is, uh, but really it's the angelic voice, the voice of the soul. Um, so uh, let's just go to the end of that story. It's a very short little piece of scripture. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And as we'll recall, Eli instructed Samuel how to respond. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Uh, and then this is the piece I'd like to think about today. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears, hears of it, tingle. Um, I just love that sentence. And... Uh, in this little moment, we have the complete arc that went on uh, in Abraham's entire life journey with God. Uh, and, um, uh, and then again, as I said, we see in the great arc of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is the arc from this gentle beginning, this gentle coming to know who God is, that takes you um, through a protracted, normally, long period of time in which this God who has come gently at first uh, begins uh, and then over time uh, draws us deeper and deeper and deeper into the mystery of who God is. Uh, because we all have conceptions, preconceptions, about what God is like or ought to be like or that we were taught that God is like, etc., etc. So we, we have already a lot of baggage about God, and, th and that's just as true of an atheist as it is of a practicing Christian. Um, atheists have to know, you know, the God they are not believing in uh, before they can really claim their atheism. Uh, we all have this mindset of what uh, God must be like. And uh, my guess is that to a person, uh, we are incorrect about it. We've... Um, um, overemphasized some things, um, underemphasized others, chosen the parts of God that we either want to glob onto or, in the case of an atheist, flee from. And um, uh, so we, we have these preconceptions uh, about what God is like. And so in the relationship uh, that happens, uh, again, God's deep voice bubbling up within us, uh, the reality is we have to learn who God is uh, all anew. It, it's sort of like uh, knowing somebody, seeing somebody say in a classroom or the workplace that your initial reaction is, ugh, wouldn't want to spend time with that person. Uh, and then for some reason you are thrust together only to discover that that person is as interesting and um, complex and a uh, dear a human being as anyone could be. Um, the same is true here. We, we have a misconception about God to begin with. It doesn't matter how sophisticated your theology is or how long you've been in church, uh, or again, to mention the atheists again, uh, how much you're clear about uh, the uh, way you've heard God has been taught in the church that you are rejecting. Um, all of these are incorrect, and um, they're naive, or they're too small, or they orient in one direction or another. Um, and I'm not trying to say that no one knows God, but uh, there's always some teaching, and sometimes uh, the learning about who God is is quite profound and startling and even disturbing. Um, if you, for example, think, you know, of God as gentle Jesus, meek and mild, 
you may have to come across uh, a the part of the nature of God that can be uh, grouchy or grisly or challenging in some way. If on the other hand, your image of God is uh, the great uh, white judge sitting up on the uh, clouds just waiting to find a sin or a peccadillo in your life, you may find a gentler, wiser, more compassionate God. Uh, the, the one that's almost always surprising to people is the God that Abraham uh, had to come to know, which is God who sacrifices the divine self uh, for the sake of uh, the creation and for the sake of the people in the creation. Uh, we think of uh, ourselves, as do the ancient people, that if we're going to have a relationship with God, it's we who must sacrifice to God. Uh, but uh, it's quite the opposite. It's, uh, it's coming into a relationship with God who never loses, of course, divine dignity, divine wholeness, uh, but nevertheless, at the, exactly the same time that God can maintain a great divine dignity, uh, God is at, uh, also... Uh, sacrificing uh, for, for us, toward us, uh, and loving us in that profound way. That's almost startling for everyone. Uh, so, uh, in this arc, we go from warm, comforting, um, embrace to let you know that uh, God is coming into your life. Uh, we go from that into what can be a very long period of coming to know God more and more deeply as God actually is. Uh, but that is never the end of the arc. The arc always ends with how this relationship is uh, going to be poignant, important, and life-changing uh, as one uh, takes this understanding of God and uh, moves it uh, out of your own interior self-experience into real-life uh, circumstances and, in many cases, exciting life changes uh, that uh, move uh, yourself and the people you're in touch with and, in certain circumstances, entire communities of people uh, forward into a, an amazing new experience. It is my observation, just as a light look at history, that uh, most of the people who've made most of the incredible life shifts have do not done so because they were uh, forced into it by a political or military or even a religious power uh, insisting that they behave or think or um, interact with each other in a certain way. Uh, changes come about because there's an interior uh, experience and people change their, not only their minds, but their whole beings. They reorient themselves uh, to a new, freer, hopefully better, um, and uh, a livelier way of living. And, and so the arc isn't completed until uh, there is a way in which this deep interiority uh, has a completion in some very real action or activity in the world we share with others. And it's right here in the very first experience Samuel has of God. I am a sea. I love that first word, sea. I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, that's not um, uh, all a delight. As a matter of fact, the first thing uh, is, on that day I will fill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house. Uh, I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Uh, so, you know, the tingling ear is not just something fabulous, although that comes down the road with the anointing first of Saul, but even more especially the anointing of um, David as this sort of ideal uh, new king to um, really push and nurture uh, the people of Israel into a, a much more 
solid, sophisticated um, kind of political reality that could sustain them uh, in the evolving po politics and nature of their experience of living in Canaan and, and how they interacted with both the ownership of the land and their relationship uh, both within the 12 tribes and uh, to their neighbors. Um, uh, so we, we have this moment when uh, uh, Samuel, as a very young boy, is uh, hearing this kind of um, tantalizing uh, note from God. And I smile because I've heard it so many times from people over the years um, that uh, they're quite surprised that when they really feel they're intuiting or, and discerning this voice of the deep uh, self within, the, the soulfulness that is part of our being, uh, one ex expects it to be pious and religious um, uh, with that deep tremor that, that one thinks of when one's standing in, a, you know, uh, in an awesome space like a Gothic cathedral or hearing uh, you know, a magnificent choir sing uh, you know, something profound and amazing. Uh, when one is being transported by a religious experience on the outside, uh, one kind of expects that that's what it's going to be like on the inside. Uh, and quite often it is, uh, whatever the message is, it comes to us with this sort of incredible sense of delight. Uh, even if it's uh, going to be perhaps difficult and challenging for people to hear and experience. Uh, so when God says uh, at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, uh, uh, the, the creation, as I stand back and look at it, God says, it is good. And uh, so in this arc of the experience of the divine within, it is always measured by goodness and a goodness that we can comprehend uh, at whatever age or stage in life we are living. Uh, and so I really love this little passage uh, from the first book of Samuel and this very early experience of what, uh, uh, what he comes uh, and how he comes to know God and what God is about to do. Uh, and, and while we're not going to spend uh, time looking at, you know, the extraordinary experiences Samuel has and the launch of both the kingship of Saul and the kingship of David and all that David goes through, uh, before the uh, second book of Samuel is finished, um, I think it's important to, to start with this little nub here and to remind ourselves that Jesus said, uh, faith the size of a mustard seed will grow into something quite, uh, quite grand indeed, a bush in that case, in that metaphor, uh, that's um, big enough that the birds can build nests in it. And that's exactly what we see here. It's just in the very first chapters of Samuel, this young boy experiencing this simple night. Uh, but uh, if we could read the whole rest of the first and second books of Samuel through this uh, precious and delightful little experience, uh, I think we would see it um, in a whole new light. So I, I hope this is helpful and thanks for listening. I will see you again on... Um, Friday when we'll continue to look at uh, the soulful journeys of figures from the Hebrew scriptures. Till then, have a great week.